Hi, everybody, and welcome to Resilience Rundown. Today on episode four, we're going to be talking about cyber resilience strategies. I'm your host, Thomas Bryant, and today I'm lucky enough to be joined by Darren Thompson, the field CTO for EMEA for Commvault. Uh, Darren, great to have you on the show. Uh, maybe you could give our uh, viewers a little bit of background uh, about uh, yourself. Yeah, certainly a pleasure to be here with you, uh, Thomas. So yeah, I'm 30 years, I'm afraid to say, in this industry now. Uh, all of those 30 years in software, uh, most of them in some way focused on digital risk. So, you know, in my time, I've I've been involved with disaster recovery projects, obviously with security projects as well. Uh, really anything that uh, denotes risk on technology and risk on the way businesses are using that technology. Uh, most of that time I've worked for software vendors, uh, but I did spend uh, a few years also in the in the cyber insurance world as well, which is probably something we'll come back to at some point. Yeah, well, well great. Um, and I've, it's super relevant, of course, for our topic today when we talk about uh, cyber resilience and different strategies that companies are looking for. Um, but one of the, the things I wanted to ask you uh, first is there was a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and it was titled, If Companies Are So Focused on Cybersecurity, Why Are Data Breaches Still Rising? Uh, and I was wondering if you had a take on that, because uh, it, it really is an interesting kind of conundrum. Yeah, it, it certainly is a conundrum. Uh, and it's one of those very simple headlines that, that, you know, when you double click, there's so much to talk about, right? I mean, I think there are contributory factors here across the technical landscape. Uh, there are cultural aspects to this. There are financial aspects to this as well. For me, on the technology side, you know, we're we're living in a world now where the threat landscape that surrounds us is very, very uh, fast moving, fast paced, expanding, um, and often I think we we gravitate to some of the attack types that worry us. And clearly, kind of ransomware and data breach are attack types that we're concerned about for good reason. Uh, but I think we sometimes forget that there are kind of what I refer to as mega trends that are affecting and kind of supercharging all of that as well. So things like cloud computing, obviously AI, social engineering and social networking, software supply chains, the internet of things. You know, these are technology trends that, you know, are always designed for good, uh, but that could be leveraged for bad. And I think that's part of the technology challenge here today. I mean, I, I would definitely lump in as well actor sophistication. So over the past decade, we've seen really the emergence of a of a dark marketplace and you know gangs and syndicates and specialists and guns for hire uh making the sort of barriers to entry uh, for criminals very very low nowadays mm -hmm. um and then i think we have some sort of more i suppose cultural issues around uh how organizations are structured how we think about cyber security and cyber breach uh you know i see a lot of organizations leaning heavily for example on disaster recovery uh concepts to protect them from breaches and for for reasons that no doubt we'll discuss that's not relevant you know that's not appropriate disaster recovery was designed typically for physical disasters of some kind uh you know a data breach presents a different kind of a problem so yeah there's a lot in there uh it's a lot to think about again culturally technology from a technology perspective as as well as financially um, but cer certainly it's a conundrum and something that I think every board of directors should be seriously pondering. Yeah. I mean, well, so you mentioned like, you know, the, some of the challenges around just the organizational structure and, and people trying to treat it like DR, are there uh, like some common challenges that you see across the board from company to company, regardless of kind of industry and, and just things that they face? Yeah, there are a few. So, so for, for one, you know, if we think, if we go back to that disaster recovery concept, you know, data protection, you know, some of the subdomains that sit traditionally within disaster recovery, typically that's a team in an organization, normally under the CIO, some sort of infrastructure delivery team. That's normally where backup and recovery sits. Of course, in many organizations, the CISOs team is quite separate and distinct. And, you know, in some organizations, they, collaborate often in other organizations not so often uh personally my observation over the past couple of years has been that there's there's got to be a coming together of those teams in every organization if we're gonna if we're gonna help build resilience in business true resilience to things like ransomware for example there are things that the security team need to be contributing to that largely blocking and tackling you know the, the criminals but also 
you know, making sure data is clean. And there are things that the traditional infrastructure team need to bring to that in the context of system recovery until they come together. And that's more of a yeah. cultural organizational issue than anything else. We're not going to solve some of these, these, these bigger problems. I think there are financial problems here as well. Like it's very hard to know where to invest dollars, uh, you know, or euros or pounds. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I see a lot of CISO organizations gravitate to, you know, the latest news, you know, the latest mm. breach, the la latest attack type and acquire technologies in good faith to try and protect their organization. But, but that leads to this situation that I've started referring to as the CISO hamster wheel, where we're, we're just kind of spinning, uh, you know, buying as much technology as we can for good reason, but then layering that onto the 50 or 60 tools we already have, only to find that in many cases, that's masking the breach. So we've got some, you know, issues around prioritization there as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, so how would you, I mean, if you were a company out there, how, where would you start? Like, how do you get started like on assessing with all these tools that you do have? Like, how do you figure out like, what do we actually have now and what are our capabilities and what, where do we go from here? Yeah. I, I, there's lots of frameworks and best practices out there that can help start us on that journey. So, you know, I, I'm not a particular fan of any of them, and you know, but 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 you know, they they all serve a purpose. So you know, NIST is something that people are looking very closely at. The Mitra framework for others is more relevant over here in in Europe. NIS is is you know a very important standard as well. You know, I, I don't gravitate to any one of those in particular. I think they all have you know relevant things to say. But a good starting point is is to look at you know, is the organisation being comprehensive? across those frameworks so if you take nist for example my, my observation is that if you if you take security spend over the past let's say five years the majority of that spend has gone into the sort of you know detect and protect phases if we're yeah. using if we're using nist um sometime at the, sometimes at the detriment for example of the recovery phase uh and, it, and if we believe, as I do, that the breach is inevitable, you better have recovery right. You know, you better be thinking very seriously about a recovery plan. Are we testing that plan? Does it work? Does everybody know what their roles and responsibilities are in all of that? And in many, many organizations, that certainly isn't the case. And so, you know, I think to start with, let's think comprehensively across whichever of those frameworks we, we favor uh, to, to make sure we're taking, you know, every phase uh, of those very, very seriously. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's, it seems like I mean, back in my IT days, a long time ago it was, we, we always tried to build a bigger wall uh, and make a bigger moat, but we forgot about, Hey, once they're in, what do we do inside of there? And, and some of those components there, I want to touch actually on another thing you mentioned back on like the organization and just the, the difference between like the IT groups and some of the security groups. Um, would you see that as like an opportunity too for just career growth, like taking a different tact, like for, for people that are just doing disaster recovery or just doing it or just doing security, do you see this as an opportunity for those folks to actually elevate their careers and their profile within a business as well? You know, I think, I think that's one of the many positive potentials in all of this right yeah. um you know we, we all want to learn and, and want to grow and every business wants to learn and grow i think we're, we're sort of at a point in history now where it is necessary for those teams to come together um there are all kinds of benefits for that for the business and for the individuals uh concerned i think you know, new roles and responsibilities are going to emerge around this concept of resilience over the next few years there's going to be a lot for the technicians and engineers to learn. Uh, technically, there's going to be a lot of kind of cross fertilization of of skills across, you know, traditional backup teams and security teams and vice versa. So, yeah, I think there's there's lots of positive potential here. Uh, you know, unfortunately, obviously, the pressures of the business mean that this is not always the number one focus. And so, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm a I'm a really big fan of of the concept of a use case. So, so I think if we're going to start to bring those teams together, maybe to workshop ideas out, well, let's, mm -hmm. let's pick some things we know we're struggling with, you know, bite-sized chunks, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. where we have a business problem. We know that it's going to take both of these teams to solve it. Uh, and so let's give them a really good excuse to get together and start to brainstorm mm -hmm. this stuff. 
I mean, you know, I'm seeing that in action right now around things like recovery testing, for example, which is a really thorny topic. It's hard. Uh, and so necessarily it being hard, you want some, you know, as many eyes on it as possible. So, yeah, I think there's tons of potential and, and there are, again, good use cases that we can we can start to work through with this. Yeah, well, I mean, so you mentioned, you know, as they get together, I mean, are there emerging technologies or trends that you see that they 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 might want to start with or that have the potential to enhance where most companies are? You know, it's interesting. I mentioned you know, a few technology trends at the top of the conversation there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned them in, in, the, in the context of them making the threat landscape more complicated and sort of supercharging yeah. the, the cyber criminal. And that's certainly true. They also happen to be, I think, some of the areas of technology where we could potentially do things we've never dreamt of, right? So if you take AI, and in particular machine learning, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very keen that people sort of embrace the idea of sort of early detection of risk. I don't think we're detecting early enough right now, typically because we're not close enough to the data. So embedding machine learning technology to look for anomaly, for example, inside data, potentially then to trigger an alert to a security tool, that's a you know that's something that could be adopted right now. We're doing mm. work at Convault that's you know demonstrating that this can be valuable. You know that's a good example around machine learning around cloud. You know this idea that you know testing has always been really really hard. Recovery testing you, you you've typically needed to you know replicate the entire production environment to do that and bring people in, bring staff in at weekends when you can yes yeah. the data. Well, we could leverage cloud to to uh, you know burst into maybe temporary cloud instances to do our recovery testing. So you know those are some of the the areas and and some of the areas where I think some of those big challenges are you know software supply chains. Uh, we saw the Solar Winds breach a couple of years ago. That was yeah you know uh, made made everybody I think sort of take a take a closer look at, at how they think about security in particular with regards to their the partners that they use. Um, yeah. and, and so that that's another topic that could warrant a lot of eyes on the problem. And so, yeah, lo lots of opportunity here. But, yeah, we've got to find those use cases, the low-hanging fruit to go after to make a real difference with. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us today. Um, I'd, I'd love to uh, send more folks your way. So um, if folks wanted to reach out and, and uh, converse with you, what's a great way for them to be able to get a hold of you on, like, the socials? Yeah, LinkedIn's the platform for me, really, uh, Thomas. Uh, I try to try and limit it to that. Otherwise, my life will be social media and nothing else. But yeah, certainly reach out to me uh, on on uh, LinkedIn. That that's definitely a good way of getting hold of me. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming, and uh, thanks everybody for watching today.